Greetings, friends, and welcome to Breakfast in the Ruins, a Michael Moorcock flavoured podcast. On this show, we welcome Andrew Nett back to Derry and Tom's to delve further into one of our passions, a publisher that looms large in our collective psyche thanks to a whole raft of outlandish and pulpish titles from the late 60s and on through to the 80s. Although in my youth I viewed paperbacks that carried quite a few publisher logos as warranting further examination, for example Sphere, Mayflower or Pan, if there was a book that was frowned upon by my teachers in the 80s, or even declared as contraband to be confiscated, it was highly likely to bear the livery of New English Library. NEL was a prolific publisher of all sorts of fiction, including several Moorcock editions in slightly oversized paperbacks, and just over my shoulder on my shelf are the 1980s NEL editions of The Distant Sons, The Warhound and the World's Pain, The Golden Barge, The Rituals of Infinity, The Entropy Tango, and The Collected Warrior of Mars Omnibus. But NEL's big business was horror, publishing James Herbert and Guy and Smith in the 70s, and a whole host of gritty and violent pulp fiction that exploited fears and fascination around subcultures and the starkly bleak political and social circumstances in the UK at the time. For this first show, dedicated to some of NEL's grittier and more exploitative 70s output, we've decided to pull on our leather breeks, swing our chains menacingly, and take a dive into a couple of examples of their extensive line of biker novels with Mick Norman's Angels from Hell and Alex R. Stewart's The Devil's Rider. So... Guard your loins, prepare for some rather alarming subject matter, rev up your engines, and join us on our run into the violent and intriguing world of New English Library's Biker Mania. We're back at Derry and Tom's, and I'm delighted that returning to Derry and Tom's is Andrew Nett, a.k.a. Pulp Curry, journalist, writer, and all-round pulp fiction fanatic, and particularly pulp paperback fanatic, who we had on last year talking about Dangerous Visions and New Worlds, his collection of essays and writing about those two uh, progressive science fiction magazines, and also we will talk about another one of those books that he published a while back. But welcome back, Andrew. Thank you very much. Lovely to be back. It's nine. Well, it's after nine in Australia where you are. You've got a delicious it looking is, glass a, of wine. It's a balmy Sunday night in Melbourne. Mm, yeah, it's a chilly Bradford <laughs> morning over here. Yeah. It's just after yeah. ten o'clock. But because you are drinking wine, I am actually going to push the boat out a little bit, and I have actually got myself a breakfast beer. Yes, yes. You know, when in Rome. Absolutely. I think I think we can basically also agree. Every single NEL biker character would would applaud that. I think so. I, I will stop at that level of depredation, though. I won't ah, go any further. Ah, ah, please do. <laughs> yes, that's probably a good thing, actually, given the, given the depredation that NEL biker <laughs> characters get up to. It's like, yeah. So, what wine are you drinking? I'm drinking a I'm drinking a Serafino, which is a sort of mild. It's a sort of a not too not too strong, not too light wine. I'm a light. I'm a light red guy. I love a light, a light red drinker, but I do like to go a little heavier sometimes. And I thought bikers, yeah. you know, why not? That sounds extraordinarily cultured. I've got. I'm going to start with a purple monkey dishwasher, yeah, which, right. which is by Evil Genius. And I did swear off dark, stupid, gloopy beers a couple of podcasts ago, but I still had this kicking around. So it's a chocolate peanut butter porter, which. Um, I'm just going to have to suck it up and do it, so I'll just crack that open. But we are here to talk about New English Library, and specifically New English Library's journey into the world of exploitation pulp novels looking at the biker culture, and we've picked out a couple. We'll talk a little bit more broadly about these things, I'm sure, but first of all, why was New English Library such a legendary publisher? That's a really good question. I think it's be, look. I mean, pulp is about it. Pulp is about so much of pulp was about taking what was already in the headlines, yeah, mm-hmm. and giving it and basically using it to sell paperbacks. Mm. So uh you mentioned one of my earlier books one well, of the first of of a series of three sort of histories of post war 
Pulp Fiction that I did was called Girl Gangs, Biker Boys and Real Cool Cats, Pulp Fiction and Youth Culture, 1950 to 1980. And we, in that book, myself and my co-editor and all the various uh, contributors, looked at how Pulp Fiction had basically mobilised societal concern, terror and fascination with youth subcultures starting from juvenile delinquents and teddy boys in the UK, juvenile delinquents in the US, and what we used to call uh, bodgies and widgies in Australia, mm -hmm. the early juvenile post-war, World War II juvenile delinquency gangs or, you know, street gangs, going to hit to, going to beatniks and then going into hippies and then going into to bikers, um, going subsequently into musicians. I think that NEL... NEL, so NEL, I think a bit of background maybe is good about mm. NEL. Yeah, would you say? So So basically created in 1961 by the Times Mirror Company in LA. It was a takeover of Ace Paperbacks and Foursquare. Existed, so it existed for about 20 years from 1961 to 1981. And in the late 1960s, there were three individuals at New English Library that Basically, we're looking at how they can modernise and appeal to, you know, the the the, the publishers' um, list. And those uh, individuals were a chap called Peter Hanning, who I'm mm -hmm. sure that you're familiar with, who we're not subsequently. Yeah, Le subsequently, legendary anthologist. Yeah, legendary anthologist went on to be a very big anthologist. Another person called Mark Howell, and a person called Lawrence James. Mm. And they were sitting around in the New English Library office, basically trying to come up with ideas for, you know, how they could sell paperbacks to young people. And, of course, I suppose the major one that they sort of settled on, the first one that they settled on was uh, the Skinhead books mm. by, um, by a chap called um, James Moffat, or at least his real name was James Moffat. And they were hugely selling books, mm. massively selling books, Moffat was an old, actually Canadian originally, an old um, alcoholic pulp writer. Uh, but because these books were sort of about, you know, skinheads and were seen as with it and very now, people actually thought they were the real thing. People, they, people actually thought that, um, you know, the, the author, uh, and I've just got to find his name now, Richard Allen, of course. Richard, Richard Allen, Allen yeah. was his pen name. Richard Allen was in touch somehow with, with skinhead culture and all that, and punk culture and all that, which is actually absolute bollocks. The closest <laughs> that Richard Allen ever got, Richard Allen was this reactionary old alcoholic, and the closest he ever got to you, you to skinhead culture, I think, was going down to a pub in London and talking mm. to a group of skinheads in a bar, actually. Anyway, one of the other things that they were interested in, that's the, the triumphant of Hanning, Al, and James, were bikers. Yeah. And in Nikers, uh, bikers had been a massive, massive, you know, post-war sensation. They were big in popular culture. They were big in movies. So they commissioned, I think in 1971, they commissioned a chap called Peter Cave, who was a science fiction writer, to write a book called Chopper. Hmm. And Chopper was a, a massive sell. Apparently something sold something like three quarters of a million copies. Yeah, incredible. Yeah. Um, and uh, from that was born a whole wave of New English Library biker books, some of which we're going to look at tonight. Yeah. So, I mean, to circle back to your original question, what is special about, what is interesting or special about New English Library? It was the way that they wrote these incredibly popular books about basically what is going on in sub various subcultures in the UK in the 1970s, skinheads, bikers, uh, punks, mm. swades, mods, the whole thing, but also did a whole lot of other things as well. I think that uh, their cover art is really interesting. These I don't know who did, I don't know who did the covers, but these very cheap but highly effective, very lurid sort of images of bikers and mods and punks mm. and things like that is really interesting. From my own perspective as a sort of pulp his, pulp historian, I'm also interested in the fact that. No one has yet done a really decent history of New English Library. Yeah, I recalled you saying that a while back. I think when we were talking about Dangerous Visions and New World, you made that point. And not so long ago, I came across something that's no longer available, 
called um, A Pictorial History of New English Library by Justin Marriott. And I tried yeah, to get hold does. of it. Yeah, he, he does the Paperback Fanatic series. Yeah. And I tried no, to get does, hold of he it. Does. He does, he does, yes. Yeah. I tried to get hold of it, couldn't find a copy at all. But in Paperback Fanatic 35, he's got his History of New English Library Part 2. But it's that, that issue is like rocking horse shit. I can't get hold of it anywhere, yeah, which is a shame. Oh. Mm. So someone out there seems to have written about them, but to what detail, I'm not sure. I know Justin. Look, I know Justin has done some work in in his very good, very good publication about them. I know he's done a lot of the the, the, the covers, and there's bits and pieces of stuff everywhere. Mm. Uh, our book, Girl Gangs, Biker Boys, and Real Cool Cats, has original some original material that also we also reprinted a an interview that a chap called Stuart Holmes had done with um with Lawrence James. Mm. And some other material, but no one's really given this a book a book length. I, I think NEL is really worth a book length study, publishing study, frankly, mm. which also tries to look at who was right, who else was writing for them, goes to talk to them, looks at the editors. I think they're probably all dead now. Mm. Um, looks at the cover art, the whole thing, you know, rather because there's stuff everywhere, including yeah. including Justin's stuff, which is the best of it, I think. Yeah, well, NEL is so stuck in. The mindset and all like the zeitgeist of of genre fiction fans in the UK. So when we were when I was thinking about hooking up with you a couple of nights ago, I just looked at my bedside table reading pile, which is it, it never goes down. If anything, it only ever increases in size. But I just reached over and I thought, which New English Library books are in that pile? And it sounds so. I'm gonna go through them now. So I'm a little bit into reading Warhead by Guy N. Smith. At the moment, that's one of the ones I've got on the go, which is a bizarre combination of uh, Cold War, Paranoia, Nuclear Threat and Voodoo. I've got the novelization of Norman J. Warren schlock classic in Seminoid, which is one of my prized possessions, funnily enough. It's uh, in great condition, but generally a really terrible book. And, of course, Terry Sneed, Say You Bastard. And recently we covered The Dark by James Herbert. So actually that was our fourth NEL novel that we've covered on the podcast because previously we okay. covered The Rats, The Fog, and Night of the Crabs. So New English Library is a, 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 just a, a permanent fixture and has been a permanent fixture in my brain since the 80s. But interestingly, and we'll get on to Angels from Hell shortly, this is probably pure coincidence, but I've got a copy of Guy and Smith's Bats Out of Hell, the NEL edition. And the owner has written on the end of it his name. Well, how about that? What a weird coincidence! Now, I'm or just I, is it an homage? Is it just it's good? Very you know, is, possibly. Is it sort of very sort of weird. So the name you just showed me uh, is Mick Norman. Yeah, who of course did one of the books. It was the pen name for Lawrence James? Yeah, the pseudonym for Lawrence James, and did one of the books we're going to talk about today. Yeah, I think it's. I think New English Library books. I think are very much in the brain of anyone that grew up, that of so many people in the UK that grew up in the seventies and eighties. Yeah, absolutely. They also were quite big in Australia. We, um, Britain, continued to remain a lot of books to Australia. Yeah. So and, and New English, there are a lot of New English Library books included in that, which you can. Mm. I, I still find them. I still find. Uh, so New English Library did what we refer to in the academic era, you know, sort of those plantation pulps. Yeah, which is a whole which you could really you could write a PhD on those those <laughs> pulps, which which are both incredibly racist, but also look, talk to the increasing prominence of a whole lot of things in society in the seventies mm. and eighties. They did horror with uh, Guy and Smith, as you say, mm. and a whole lot of other authors. They did occult stuff. Um, there's a very well-known series of westerns that NEL did called, did called the Edge mm. series, which were a sort of these hard-boiled, very violent westerns. Mm. Um, and and James edited Lawrence James edited that series. Um, and I still find these. So I can still find NEL books in op shops and secondhand shops mm. today in, a, mm. in in Melbourne. Um, but it's it's it's. It's not just a sort of question about because it's not just a question of looking at 
NEL from the point of view, I think, of who were the authors, what did they write. That is important. Mm. But it's, it's, it's looking at how they sold books, how they published books, what the reaction was to that, the, the working lives of the authors, um, how NEL were, were positioned in 1970s British and international publishing, because they also did, you know, they also did uh, science fiction. They did, mm. you know, they, they, they read, I think they did the first time that I ever read June. Uh, Frank Herbert's June. That was my. That was the NEL edition of that. So they were right. also publishing major wor- works as well. These these guys and women who were doing it, who would be. I mean, I just recently published an academic study of Horwitz Publications, which mm. was Australia's foremost pulp publisher after the war, and I interviewed about twenty authors and editors and things, and they were all in extremely advanced stages of their lives and I would imagine that to the degree that any of the people in NEL uh, to do with NEL are still alive they would be old and that history needs to be captured Mm. so if someone is out there listening and has the time and energy to do this please do us all a favor and do a decent if I was in the UK I would be bang on doing a history of NEL as my number one research project Mm. well the the chap as part of that triumvirate that you mentioned who isn't Peter Herning or Lawrence James the name of which has just slipped my mind. Mark Howell. Mark Howell. I actually looked him up uh, about a month ago to try and track him down. And from what I can understand, he moved to Florida in the late 90s. And I believe he passed away about two years ago. So. Yeah, see, that always happens. You, you get onto this stuff and you realise, oh, they, they, they died six months ago, you know. Mm. And th- exactly. there's no, there's no wonder course. these things were so popular with people and why they're so common in, in bookshops and why they're kind of ubiquitous in secondhand shops in the horror and sci-fi sections. Because I think in one of the articles in Girl Gangs, Biker Boys and Real Cool Cats, it says that at one point they were publishing 70 hardcovers and up to 200 paperbacks per year, wow. which is just a, a... And when you think by today's standards, 200 paperbacks a year and a biker novel selling three quarters of a million copies can you imagine modern publishers and modern authors looking back at those numbers? It's just, it's absolutely incredible how vibrant the book scene was in those days. It's just really mind blowing. And wouldn't it be wonderful to capture those kind of times again, where what modern people would probably say a hack science fiction writer knocking out an exploitation biker book in six weeks and it sells three quarters of a million copies. Absolutely incredible. Well, it's the same with, as I, say, I think I, I, I made that point, it's the same with Richard Allen, a.k.a. James Moffat's mm. Skinhead. Mm. That book was phenomenally, it was, it's, it, look, it has made, it, it's an interesting book. It's a fascinating book about class. It also has some terrible racism and mm. some pretty full-on sexual violence in it. But it's writing about this skinhead culture where no one else is in the early 70s, and it was huge. And there is mm. a documentary on YouTube which co- seems to come and go onto YouTube. I've burnt a copy of it now. Uh, it was a British television documentary about NEL, and there's actually some footage of Moffat, right. and they interview Moffat. Yeah. But the, the thing is that this guy is writing Skinhead, and it's huge. Yeah. And it's so big, they're assigning it to classes in schools because mm. they're, so, they're so happy just that the young people are just reading any, any kind of book at all. Mm. And there's all interviews, and they do the same thing with the biker books. There's interviews with these people, these young young people, and there's interviews with bikers where they're talking about the fact that, yeah, look, you know, um, Richard Allen, he has to be, he has to be a skin. He has to be, he has to be inside our culture because he just writes about it too accurately. And it's the same with the bikers. Oh, he has to be a biker because, mm. you know, and it's a, they're so starved for for decent and not so decent cultural representations of themselves. Mm. These, these these youth groups and bikers and things like that that they'll just they'll just devour it. Mm. And NEL is NEL is is I mean, British publishers were doing books about teddy boys in the nineteen fifties, and they were doing books about you know they were juvenile delinquents and that kind of stuff. But NEL was the first publisher that really took these emerging youth tribes in nineteen seventies Britain seriously and started publishing about them. To get back to your initial question, that is what is really important about NEL. Mm. They're doing that. It's selling huge amounts of stuff. I mean, there's 
Skinhead was so big. And then I think he, he did another six or so books. And then he did Suedehead. And then there were mods and there were punks and, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, one of the most alarming things about the interview with um, Lawrence James in, uh, sorry, Girl Gangs, Biker Boys and Real Cool Cats is that he says that he actually worked really, really hard as an editor with Moffat to turn down the racism and the more outre elements in the Skinhead series to the point where he said he found the racism in them so abhorrent and he found Moffat so difficult to work with that he ended up escaping him by assigning him to a different editor <laughs> altogether. <laughs> That's right. Is... He said, I didn't want anything more to do with it. I didn't yeah. want anything to do with it. Yeah. And he got more unreliable because he was dr- his drinking got worse. But the yeah. guy just, oh, what a, the guy was just a, 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 a soldier as a writer. Yeah. So we're going to talk about Lawrence James' first novel in a couple of minutes. And it is remarkable to think that when you read Angels from Hell, that the writer of Angels from Hell was ex- describing another author as too extreme. <laughs> Reading Very it by, nice. t- by today's standards is really amazing. Now, I've not read Skinhead, and we may well touch upon that at a future time. But I don't have the NEL edition of Angels from Hell because I couldn't track it down on eBay, so I have the Omnibus edition, which I managed to pick up. And I also got the Omnibus edition of the first three or four, I think, Skinhead novels in the same format. Sadly, I'm going to be something of a letdown, and I'm going to be talking about an Angels from Hell novel that isn't actually an NEL publication, but that was quite hard to track down. So Lawrence James writes this as his first novel, and actually went on to have a really extensive writing career afterwards, didn't he? Because he wrote 33 Deathlands series novels in the 80s and 90s, which somehow, I can't believe there was an English-written science fiction series called Deathlands, and it completely passed me by. And it must have passed Pops, my granddad, by as well. He used to give me all of these books, and I completely missed that. So actually, Lawrence James was a hugely prolific author after turning his hand to writing. And I've never heard of that series. Yeah. I, I mean, I'm sure I've probably seen the books around somewhere, but I have not. I mean, if I if you showed me a cover, I would go, oh, yes, I've seen that. But... Mm. I'd, I'd never even heard of them. So mm. let's let's talk about Angels from Hell, anyway. So this this is my... Apart from reading the essay in in your book, this is this was my first exposure to an NEL biker novel. It's a fairly standard setup, I would think, if you're thinking about what is a an, like an exploitation biker pulp story going to be about. It's the story of a, a former squaddy, Jerry Vinson, and he sets out on a campaign to take over a chapter of Hell's Angels from within and the current chapter president is something of a rum cove and he's called vincent and jerry and his lady or in biker parlance his mama brenda gain acceptance through uh, kind of the power of the fist in a series of <laughs> rather sordid trials and that's the essential setup but there is so much more going on here that makes it so much more textured and actually quite surprising because it kicks off essentially rather shockingly, with some of this biker gang kicking a blind boy to death down a tunnel. A blind at Buddhist. A blind, a blind Buddhist. Buddhist. Yeah, that's, that's how it starts. Yeah, to death down, down a tunnel at Hither Green Station in London, which is pretty shocking from the outset, and it doesn't really slow down from there. But what what is most fascinating about this, quite apart from the fact that by modern standards a lot of it reads as fairly reprehensible, is this strange picture it builds of a dystopian Britain. And over time, you find out this is actually set 20 years in the future from when it was written, or maybe 25 years in the future from when it was written. And it's actually, a dis- to some degree, it's a dystopian Britain is fucked book. And I've said before on this podcast, one of my favourite genres of fiction is Britain is absolutely fucked, because it always you know, plucks a few cards. And this is a really, really good example of that. And that was really, really surprising. And it wasn't until I got fairly well into the book that a date is mentioned. It's 1994. So this is written in the early 70s, but it's actually set in 1994. There are a couple of very strange, accurate predictions, one which I'll get to later on, which was actually highlighted in here in pencil. (laughs) Someone who owned this book has annotated it in pencil. And it says, page 207. Prescient. 
And on page two, <laughs> on, on on page two hundred and seven, it refers to the England football team's failure to qualify for the World Cup in abject circumstances. <laughs> and any any England football fan will know that was the year Graham Taylor's England failed to qualify for the World Cup for the first time in God knows how long. So whoever was reading this book was was highlighting in pencil all of these interesting points about this projection of the future. Absolutely fascinating. So that was the biggest surprise for me, the fact that this wasn't just a straight biker novel, it was a mashup of two genres. Yeah, that is interesting. I agree. I totally agree with that. I mean, so biker pulp, biker biker books were big in the US. They were also they were also very big here in Australia. Mm. Uh Horwitz, that publisher I mentioned earlier, they put out uh, their own series of of we call them bikies here, but let's yeah. just it's it's called biker pulps. And they're basically the 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 Australian and I've read a few of the Australian biker pulps. They are essentially soft core porn with a bit of violence in them. Mm. Um, and I agree that what's so what's really interesting about the Mick Norman, aka you know, um, was name Lawrence James books, is that they really do elevate. There's there's a lot of these. You know, there's some some fairly reprehensible sexual violence in them. Mm-hmm. There's a lot of violence per se. But there's also this weird, yes, dystopian vibe that they're mm. basically continually giving off. There's this, there's this. I'm just trying to think of it. Just here, this this future. So the book is set in this, as you say, a dystopian England, which is essentially under this kind of dictatorship, mm. and the dictatorship has um, wiped out biker gangs, mm. and there's only five biker gangs left. There's the last heroes, which is the biker gang that is the subject of um, the book we're just discussing, that's led by Vincent. The Jokers in Birmingham, the Martyrs in Manchester, the Blues in Glasgow, and this nomadic, semi sort of mythological tribe called the Wolves, with who are out in in Wales, and all the other bikers have been destroyed. They've been purged, and the same thing has happened to the Hell's Angels in the US. So it's very much this sort of dystopian world. There's a real sense of cultural wash-up from the 1960s. The 60s are well, you know, peace, love and brown rice is well and truly over. We're into the (laughs) dystopian, economically depressed 70s. The books are anti-royalist. In addition to all this sort of the usual sort of stuff that is in all these bikey novels, which is, you know, this focus on what what bikes they're riding, which I'm Mm. always a bit crap at because I don't ride a bike, and this fascination with the notion of the the run yeah you know where they're basically that the book opens with a run where the bikes as a sort of the bikey gang all go out on this run into public and as i say end up running running over sort of blind buddhists and doing all these other terrible things yeah there's references to a clockwork well there's kind of references to a clockwork orange Mm -hmm. the angry brigade roger corman there's quotes from milton there's these weird titles like The Order is Rapidly Fading, which is a mm-hmm. Dylan song. So so yeah, if you didn't know anything about who um, Mick Norman was, mm. you'd think, oh, yeah, this guy's actually quite well read and he's mm. he's he's got a finger on a certain sub, subcultural zeitgeist that's going on, you know. Yeah. He's not, which you can't say that about any of the Australian biker books I've, I've read. Mm. or the few in the US that I've read. Mm. I think James, being an editor, certainly puts him at the centre of all that and makes this all feel, I don't know, probably a pretentious way of saying it, but a little bit more literary because there there are references in there, and you've, you've mentioned some of them, and there's one very specifically relevant, I suppose, to this podcast, where you get these chapters that intersperse the main action with things like news reports and uh, pieces from newspapers and things like that. And mm. one of them, and then from the news at nine says there is still no news of the missing round the well yachtsman Mike Cornelius who set off nine weeks ago in his catch Elric <laughs> to sail around the world and through the northwest passage. So there's all these lovely little references. The, the Moorcock universe is just omnipresent and yeah. everywhere. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> you know. Um, th- yes. This is what's making me want to read the rest of them, quite apart from, I mean, we'll get to how this book ends and some of the synchronicity around that one as well. But there's there's another lovely bit later on where one of the characters, Rupert, who's this um, film producer's right-hand man, 
when this film producer wants to set up uh, getting the the biker gang to be genuine extras in his biker movie. And Rupert is in London. It says, Rupert pushed along the pavement past the frontage of what he remembered used to be a pawnee bookshop. Since Longford and Mary Whitehouse both entered politics, their joint lobby had been almost totally effective in clearing literary filth from the streets. Sadly, sex crimes had rocketed. If one now wanted to purchase adult reading, one had to write for a catalogue to one of the few firms that were allowed to advertise discreetly in the papers. The danger was that everyone knew that police intercepted mail and that you put on a list of known sex deviants. You couldn't win. So, again, to someone of my age, Mary Whitehouse is also burned into our memory because Mary Whitehouse led the National Viewers and Listeners Association who had a vendetta against things like Doctor Who and was responsible for getting Doctor Who turned down from the genuinely terrifying 70s heyday of Robert Holmes. And Lord Longford, who... uh, Another interesting character. So they were both Christian conservatives, and they both had a hell of a lot of clout at the time. So them going into politics and becoming powerful is one of the backdrops to this strange, dystopian future Britain. Longford was probably a more complex character because he published a really controversial pornography report called the Longford Report and campaigned against pornography and criticised the British press and media, saying it was trembling on the brink of obscenity. But he also had quite a complex relationship with homosexuality, because he described gay people as handicapped and immoral, but he was one of the key features in supporting decriminalisation of homosexuality. So you've got these two really complex British characters who loomed large over the media in the 1970s, and this in the 90s are hugely powerful government figures. So that's the first part of that. And there's the, second, the, the next two paragraphs are also interesting, because it says, Nearly there. That was the front now. Light she was, and fleet of foot, which is described as a Soho bookshop, which, of course, is a take on the genuine bookshop. Um, what was it? Dark they were, and... I forgot what the bloody hell it was called already. Um... A, a genuine counterculture bookshop in Britain, uh, sorry, in Soho, in the 70s. So he goes there, and it goes on to say, the seedy, balding figure peered in through the shop window. It was. The face turned to him, and roomy, vacant eyes looked through him. It wasn't. Just for a moment, Rupert thought he had recognised a leading screenplay writer of five years ago, an author who had produced a classic anti-police novel. A year or so after, he'd been busted. The whisper was that he'd been fitted by a jilted girlfriend, and his head had collided with a stone banister as he was being led away for questioning. He'd never written again. No, it couldn't have been old D. He'd gone back to live in Ireland. In fact, Rupert was sure that someone had told him a month ago that he'd died. So there's all these little references that are almost throwaway, and I haven't got a clue who this might be referring to, but I just get the sense that it's referring to somebody real. That's one of the things that elevates what otherwise is a sort of fairly trashy biker Mm. book. The other thing is the writing. I think, Mm. you know, James could write, obviously, Mm. you know, editor for NEL. And that's that's the other part of the thing is that, so he's an editor at NEL. He's he's editing. I was just rereading bits and pieces of the interview that he did with uh, uh, with, with, that's in our book, and he's talking about the fact that he's getting really disillusioned. He's only thirty, but he's already been in publishing. For, you know, he's been in publishing for seven or eight years. He's been working with Moffat. He's sort of pissed off with Moffat. He's basically been meeting all these journalists, meeting all these writers. And the thing is, he pit, you know he gives them a, a book idea, and say, you know they get paid. I think about one hundred and fifty pounds at the time, which is probably quite a lot in seventy one, seventy two, seventy three. Mm-hmm. Take him out to lunch pitches them an idea, go and write this book, here's, you, you know, you get this amount of money, £150, and I think it's 4% of profits or something like that is what NEL paid. And he's going, look, I'm really over this. This Is is this all that publishing is? And then he goes, well, actually, I can do, I can do this. When Peter Cage Chopper becomes popular mm. and spins off into, I can't remember exactly how many, how many Peter Cage biker books there are, but there's at least three, another three after that. He goes, I can do this. Mm. So he writes... Writes Angels from Hell, submits it to NEL, it gets accepted, and then everybody, he tells everyone, actually, I wrote that. And it's very successful as well. He could really write. If I, if I could read something here from, mm. uh, you know, this is, so we talked before about the fact that these biker books, they're, they're obsessed with the idea of the run. Mm. 
you know, and here they're going on a run. And so the, the, the story is that, as you say, they've got the, the last heroes led by this guy called Vincent, and there's these two lefties, Gerald and Brenda, who are out to find the angels. Um, they're, they're anarchists, and as you say, um, Gerald's an ex IR, you know, British Army veteran in the, you know, in, in Northern Ireland, so he can fight. They join the gang. I have to say that uh, Brenda's initiation is far more horrific than um, Gerald's is, but they join mm-hmm. the gang. Jerry becomes a sort of rival for the leadership of the of of the last heroes with Vincent, and into this is this film producer called Don Simons, who's this gay film producer who wants to make a biker film mm. uh, using the last heroes, and of course that's. A complete homage to a 1966 Roger Roger Corman's first biker film was released in 1966, The Wild Angels. Uh, he Corman did another one, two, three, four by another four biker films after that, and of course that was that also utilised real life biker gangs in the production yeah. of it. Um, and it's you know it was a huge hit. May for, so it was made in, in 15 days on a budget of $360,000 and apparently Corman got the idea when he saw an article about a Hells Angels biker funeral in a January 1966 issue of Life magazine. He thought, mm. I, can, I can make a biker film. <laughs> so, and it's a, it's a massive hit. Their credo is violence, their god is hate, was the publicity tag, mm. which is very NEL too. So this guy wants to do a, a film. Gerald, who's the smarter of the two sort of semi leaders of the last heroes, thinks actually this is could could not work. This could not be a great idea. Vincent mm. wants to use the idea for the film to to try and get one up on Gerald. So they go for, they go on this run. And this is this is the run. The still warm air trembled at their passing and was still. An occasional lorry driver saw them ghost past him a raggle-taggle band of outlaw riders. Then they were rolling on the motorway, headed for the M1, speed building, hair streaming, eyes squinting against the pressure of the summer strip stream. Far behind them and far ahead of them, the police cars were beginning to roll, straps tightening under firm, law-abiding chins and fingers ramming shotgun shells into the breeches of law officer sawn-off pump-action guns. Stroking the polished walnut stocks with a sick kind of near sexuality, the police were ready and waiting, and it would soon be time for outlaw bride and police groom to consummate their union. (laughs) Far-fetched. Think of all the hate that lies in love. Think of all the love that underlines hate. Without Hell's Angels, the police would have no super enemy. If the police and their civilian bastard offshoot, the vigilantes, did not exist, who would the angels have to hate and fear? So they travel through the ending night. The run is on, well on. Mm -hmm. 20 or so mind-blowing monsters, double lining at 90 plus up and onto the biggest of the motorways, number one. If you had a helicopter that July night, you could have ridden low over them and seen all. Leading, Vincent, slightly ahead of Dylan, both riding the Angels Elite Hogs, Harley Davidsons. Since the clamp down in the early 70s, motorbikes had almost gone out of production, even for legal citizens. This meant that all the chopper bikes ridden by the Angels dated from about 1972. Vincent straddled an Electroglide, a 600 weight motorcycle with 1200cc thrusting it on. All the trim that made it a Rolls Royce bike had been cut off and the chrome added. When pushed, it could carry Vincent along at over 100 miles per hour. Dylan rode the slightly smaller and lighter Superglide, painted in day-glow colours with a flake finish. The frame and seat had been lowered and the front forks raked and extended by about 12 inches. The mudguards had been peeled back to the minimum, with footrests and control pedals pushed right forward. High-rise ape hanger bars had been added, gleaming in polished chrome. The exhaust pipes had also been chromed and dragged on on either side of Dylan's broad shoulders. It was a thing of supreme beauty and a joy to Dylan's dark soul. I mean, it goes on. But that's yeah. actually pretty good writing, you know. It, yeah, it's it's great. And this this build-up to the run 
in, in maybe in contrast to the second book that we're talking about, because that has a build up to a run as well as the climax of the novel. This one is really leanly written. The point of view characters' perspectives are really clear, really well defined. The description of the run is great. And once the action kicks off where the lorry driver sees them and thinks, these are the guys who have been in the papers. I'm not having this. And this lorry driver driving this huge cargo, dragging this huge cargo trailer with huge steel pipes on it. You start to get some violence, some action. One of the poor bikers gets impaled through the head by one of these huge pipes. But that chapter has got a really fascinating part in it. You referred in your reading to the police and the vigilantes. And we get this bit from a radio station where there's like a, a show that people tune into and the vigilantes being off-duty policemen or, as we find, pretty much anybody, <laughs> very shortly. They've had this chase, they've thrown a grenade under this truck and killed the guy. That's also killed four police officers, so the, the game really is now on. And it suddenly switches from the run to... That was King Cliff with his new ragga rock version of Peace in the Valley. Well, brothers and sisters, seems there's not too much of the old peace in England's green and pleasant valleys this warm morning. The latest on the cycle drive, currently being run by the last Heroes Hells Angels gang, seems to show that the last may soon be the past. We'll all cross our fingers, brothers and sisters. I can see a couple of fingers uncrossed down in Bournemouth, and we'll all hope for the best. And of course, for the endest of the worstest. Latest we have... Here it is, off the shoulder and straight to you. The gang that's already been responsible for the deaths of several people, including eight policemen, narrowly and luckily avoided a trap set for them. That was at the junction of the M for Motorway 1 and the M for Motorway 6. 6. So drivers, I should steer clear of that junction for the next hour or so. Four of the animals are already dead on the highway, and the remainder of the depleted mob are still headed for Birmingham. So, get ready vigilante brothers and sisters, arise and sharpen up those knives. While you're doing all that, here's some good music for you. It's the blast from the past, a ray from the grave, a zoom from the tomb, the best from the rest. It's the late and very great Eddie Cochran with the magic of Dark Lonely Street. Suss you soon. I, I was actually going to read that exact piece, and if I could continue, a little yeah. bit later on, they have this terrific description of the vigilantes. Yeah. Scurrying through side streets, black dots of people, all heading for the motorway. Mainly women, not young. Hair swept up in curlers, a few men, <laughs> red clothes, some women in dressing gowns, and lime green fluffy bedroom slippers. <laughs> Occasionally a flash of weak sunlight of something metal held in the hand or tucked in the belt. Up and onto the road, hundreds waiting, waiting for the last heroes, winging nearer. Three minutes away, the distant early warning of the powerful engines Police sirens whining, whining at their heels, containing them, but not yet catching them closer, catching them closer. And so there's actually, there's actually then, which is a great sort of description of this mum and dad sort of, because that, that's the thing about these books that, and what, what elevates, I think, again, getting that thing about what elevates the, the, the Mick Norman, aka Lawrence James books is a dystopian England where the bikers, are actually at war, mm. literally at war with the police and with conservative society. Mm. You know, and there's various factions within that. And one group that's on the side of the police is this weird citizens vigilante group. Yeah, Middle who, England. Yeah, Middle England. Middle Middle England. Yeah, you know, in their curlers with their pitchforks, ready. And I think later on there actually is is a scene where. Where they basically is this conflict between the bikers and the and the and the vigilantes, and you know, I think one of the bikers comes off worse for wear from that. And oh, it's like it's, that. it's only a couple of paragraphs later from what yeah. you've just read. So poor Dylan. Now at this point, you're thinking these these last heroes are actually pretty much everybody in this book is is a, is a prick. <laughs> no, but it's very nice, and we've already had references, like offhand references, to how. The when the the last heroes kill, uh, I think it's a solicitor or a bank manager or something. They also rape his secretary, and it's very cold and it's very daughter. grim. His daughter, yeah. Yeah, daughter, yeah, it's very cold, it's very grim, it's very nihilistic. But there's something strangely satisfying about the point where Dylan, who was one of the guys who engaged in this behaviour, gets caught out 
by these vigilantes when the police hang back. The vigilantes have filled this junction. A lot of the bikers have got through. The police hang back and watch. And Dylan gets dragged off his bike by this crowd of Middle Englanders. And it says, Although he died quickly, the mob were not easily satisfied. His head was hacked from his shoulders and passed gleefully from hand to hand. His clothes were ripped to shreds. Some women dipped pieces of his jacket in his blood and took them away. One elderly woman, dressing gown and hair still in tight curlers, got the biggest cheer when she went and sliced his genitals from the white flesh of his stomach, holding them high over her head. Violence breeds violence. <laughs> yeah, that amazing, amazing. I, you know, and, and again, he's a good writer. James yeah. is a really and this this book, it move it moves like a run. It's a strong. Yeah. It's just you know, there's there's. There's no le- there's no fat in this thing at all, you know. Mm. The, I mean, obviously because the guy's belting it out so quickly on the typewriter, but also he knows how to write. Yeah, the thing about the radio station appealing out to the vigilantes, the thing that struck me about that straight away was that's like the Greek chorus radio broadcaster from the Warriors. No, oh, yes, that's right, that's right. Yeah. But but it's, it's yeah, whereas, whereas in the Warriors that kind of occurs fairly regularly. Now I've never read the Sol Urich original novel, so I don't know if that radio station character is a character in the Sol Urich novel. So it may well be that that predated this, and Lawrence James is refer- is referencing that as well. I read the Sol. I actually read the. I think we've got a review of the Sol Urich novel in Girl Gangs, Biker Boys, and Real Cool Cats. It's very different to the film. Hmm. If if that's the case that it's not actually in the Sol Urich novel, it's very very interesting and and, and one of those weird pieces of um, you know coincidence that you get this kind of Greek chorus radio station accompanying the action, explaining to people what's going on and directing them to where the the last hero stroke the warriors are, and this predates the Warriors movie by I don't know six or seven years, probably. Yeah, there's also. Probably a complete coincidence, but but interesting. No, maybe, maybe not. I mean, because I mean, there's also things that are, you know, we talked about the fact that there's sort of meta meta fiction elements in this book. There's a film that's being made within the book. Mm. They they quote newspaper headlines. There's also a scene. So so the I believe the run the run that we've just been talking about is to go and meet the film producers in an abandoned quarry to make the film. Mm. And there's a scene. I actually haven't marked it in my Kindle, so I can't read it. But there's a scene where there's a, I think there's an informer in um, the bikey gang, The Last Heroes, and there's actually That's text right. of the of the, the note he's writing saying they're going to meet the film producer in this quarry. Um, this is happening. You know, and, okay, you can pay me now. And there's a sort of addendum from the police on the, on the end of that saying, uh, t- yeah, the informer's giving us some good information. Don't pay him anything. Arrest him. Put him in jail. Yeah. So, you know, the police are bastards about, are complete bastards about this too, oh, you know. The, the police are super bastards. And, yeah. I mean, at, at the end of the day, they're the um, the weapon of a, of a fascist state for a start. Yeah. But you actually get a, an insight into one of the police's minds, one of the police officers' minds when they get to the quarry. So, of course, they're doing this run to the quarry in order to make this film for Don Simon and his producer, Rupert. And... So we get a lot of um, content in there about um, how people swing both ways. And actually, one of the things I think it's fair to say about this novel, even though we've referenced one of the quite grim references, stark references to rape, the book has quite a, an open hand with regards to sexuality because some of the Hell's Angels swing both ways. Oh, yeah. There's a really striking part when Vincent has initiated Brenda he could have killed Jerry because Jerry's killed one of his right hand men in a in a, a a display of violence and you know an authority. And Brenda really steps in and saves Jerry. She saves his backside and she puts herself through a quite rough sexual experience at the hands of Vincent, which you get from Jerry's perspective. It's not very explicit, but you do get the sense that essentially Brenda is being rimmed everything by Vincent. And then Vincent approaches Jerry and forcefully, violently French kisses him after going down on Brenda and Jerry gets a hard on. <laughs> so that's. Yeah, right. Yeah. Yeah. And it's, 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 Jerry feels a staring in his pants. So this is, this is really, really surprising that you've got this strange open handedness 
when it comes to sexuality on behalf of a lot of the characters. And you've got the Rupert character who is quite heavy-handedly portrayed. Or a, predatory, a predatory gay filmmaker who yeah. treats his gay producer horrifically. Yeah. 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 But we're at a point now where it's plainly obvious that those two characters have a kink for each other. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. the interplay between those two characters does actually suggest there's a level of sexual dependency on each other. And where Don Simon, the film producer, is butch and macho and aggressive, actually the scenes where he's in bed with Rupert and Rupert's kink is to please Don. There's a point at which you start thinking, right, It's really, it would be really, really easy to be critical of these characterizations, but actually you start to verge then upon kink shaming, <laughs> almost. You know, to what degree do you kind of stop yourself and go, hang on a minute, people do have these kinks, you know? Th yeah, there's, there's, a, there's actually a game, there's actually, in, in, I think, in the follow-up book to this one, which was, so this is, and the next, the next one in the series, we're jumping ahead a little bit, Angel's Challenge. Yeah. There is a gay bikey game. Yeah, called I can't remember what they're called, but the ghouls. The ghouls. They dress in this sort of they they dress in this kind of uh psychedelic gear and that, you know, they're they're this really fucking nasty gang of yeah. gay bikes. So there's yeah. there's there's a lot of weird there's a lot of there's a lot of things going all over the place. Yeah. In this. Yeah. It's yeah. It's, and, it's it's really fascinating. And of course Don and Rupert are also on the government list of social deviants, we find. Yeah. That's that's right. So, so when the police hear that the biker gang are making a run to this quarry, it gives the police every excuse they need, or they feel they need, to kill two birds with one stone. One is take the biker gang down, and the other is to engage in classic police queer bashing, yeah. which which gives you the 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 motivation for the police. And we said earlier, it's it's hard to sympathise with Dylan or pretty much anybody in this book, and it's hard to root for anybody. But the, the narrative, the author, authorial voice, doesn't really try to convince you to. But even when we get into the head of that police officer who's come to tackle these murdering rapist bikers, and it turns out that he's also an ex-soldier, we get an insight into his motivations, and he has a flashback to beating an Irish boy's head to pulp during the Troubles. So we get this introduction to, introduction to a police officer, and there is absolutely no way at all that you're invited to in any way identify with this police officer is instantly flashing back to enjoying beating a child to death in Northern Ireland. Then we get this, really, the payoff of the book where all sorts of things happen. The quarry scene, there is so much going on in that quarry shoot, it, right down to the star of the film, a gay actor, essentially trying to sexually assault Vincent, the gang leader, and coming off pretty badly. The female actor is sexually assaulted by some of the bikers. Everything goes to hell in a handcart. And then 50 coppers turn up with weapons and Jerry's laid a trap for him. And it all just turns into a mini war film in a quarry for mm, a chapter. Mm. And I didn't see that coming. <laughs> God. Yes, I think I, I think I saw that coming. I think oh. I think I'd been I'd cribbed, I think, and read because I, 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 I'd read about it in one of the articles in our book, so mm. I could see. Look, I think it's worth pointing out. It's it's not the case now, and probably shouldn't be. But bikers were there was this, and, and, and as there are with all these subcultures, you know, in terms of mainstream Joe Joe and Joanne public. Mm. They have a love hate fascination revulsion aspect with bikers, and mm. and bikers were I mean the Hell's Angels were a major law. I mean the, where all this started from, where, where it sort of there've been bikers in Britain, you know, since since the post war era, and they they, they used to call them tun up boys mm. um, or greasers, um, and they've been in Britain, you know, since 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 the just the early post war era, and they've also been in the US after the war. But I mean, where where all this comes from, of course, is the Hell's Angels. Hmm. You know, the, who are, are founded in 1948 in California. Interestingly, according to the Hell's Angels website, the club's name was first suggested by an associate of the, of one of the founders who had served in the Hell's Angels squadron of flying tigers in 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 China during World War Two. And it's you know it's chapters of the Hell's Angels spread throughout America and then the, the mm. New Zealand. I'm I'm not sure if Britain had one. Certainly got them in Australia, and they were in the 1960s. They were sort of linked to the counterculture, 
you know, they were connected to San Francisco's Height Ashbury district. They were linked to prominent members of the counterculture like uh, Ken Kesey and Allen Ginsberg and Jerry Garcia of the Grateful Dead and Timothy Leary were all sort of linked to the to the Angels. Of course, they also had some pretty significant criminal connections as well to drugs and prostitution and things like that. But I suppose where I'm going is that there's that book by Hunter S. Thompson. Hunter S. Thompson does that book on the bikers, which is quite a sort of sophisticated portrayal of the Hells Angels. Mm. He rides with a Hells Angels group for a certain amount of time. And then, of course, there's Easy Rider, which is in 1969 and is is huge and basically cements the biker as the sort of outlaw, countercultural hero in a sort of increasingly authoritarian, mechanised, technological, mainstreamed world, mm. which is where, you know, which is then flowing on into these books because the biker, what, as we keep saying, what's interesting about these NEL books is that the bikers, the angels, the Hells Angels group, whatever they're called, the jokers or whatever they're called, some pretty unsavoury characters who do some terrible things, but they're also posited as largely as the rebels and the rebellion against this sort of authoritarian fascist British police state. Yeah. Yeah, and that had far more resonance in 1971, 1973 when these books were coming out than it does now, obviously, but it was big. People wouldn't have had to make too much of a stretch if I was reading a copy of Chopper or, you know, Angels from Hell in the early 1970s, I wouldn't have had to make too much of a stretch to go, yeah, bikers, of course they're they're doing it to the man. You know, they're sticking it to the cops. They're they're free. They're free and they're riding, they're doing runs and, yeah, it's it's amazing, which is the whole fascination around these guys and that that's present all throughout the post-war era but it also really crystallises with Easy Rider, which is such a sort of huge cultural touchstone and then Mm. basically unleashes this tidal wave of biker, motorcycle, biker cinema everywhere. Mm. Yeah, that that point is one that's easy to miss today, very easy to miss, because when I was reading it, I was thinking about Jerry and his motives. I was thinking, what, what are Jerry's does is Jerry going to be revealed to have some kind of ulterior motive for joining this gang? But actually, all the, what you find through right through to the end is his motive is actually pretty pure and straightforward. He's an ex-soldier who rejects society and rejects what it's become and wants, I don't know, for want of a better expression, the freedom of you know the rule of the pack or whatever and, and freedom from the rule of society and that his that is his motive is an embittered ex soldier looking for a place in something new something more um intimate with a group of people who he can spend time with and not be kind of restricted by the state because one of the other interesting things we find out towards the end of the book post quarry battle another detail that that spills out is that this is uh, a hardcore fascist government, but it's, it actually grew out of an oppressive socialist Labour government, we find, yes. at the end of the book, which is, I think we've referenced this a couple of times, it's it's more unusual to get that, but it did happen a lot in the 70s. And particularly, I'm guessing, if Lawrence James is a fairly middle-class or upper-middle-class writer, his view of a dystopian Britain is substantially different from from that of, I don't know, more people who enjoy that function tend to think dystopian government must be right-wing. But on this case, it's grown out of an oppression, oppressive socialist Labour government. So, yeah, there's there's a certain purity to that that I think is really, really hard to miss. And if this, you know, this is written, I don't know, 26, 27 years after World War Two, we've had the Korean War in between those two things, which traumatised another generation of British soldiers and conscripts. And then we had the Troubles in Northern Ireland it's easy to miss stuff like this, reading it with a modern eye. And this is, I think, is, must be one of the things that appeal to people is there's no matter how brutal or reprehensible or by today's standards even repugnant and reprehensible some of the content of these books is, I can imagine to readers in the 70s, particularly in 70s Britain, where times were hard and we're having the winter of discontent and all that business where, and, and people really are, fucked off with the government and the post-war dream of of the Attlee government is falling to pieces around everybody. This stuff has a real raw appeal. Oh, totally. totally. And I, I actually would take it a, I would take your analysis a step further. I think it's very clear in the book that 
Jerry and Brenda go and find the, what's the gang called, the last heroes, because they actually want to use them as a vehicle to oppose the government. Mm. You know, they, I think there's a line about them having gone to young anarchist meetings together. I think they met at a young anarchist That's meeting. Right. Yeah, you're and right. then they basically decided that this was just crap, the young anarchist stuff. Um, so we really, the only people who are really going to oppose the government are the biker gangs, which have largely been outlawed and destroyed. Yes. Um, yeah. So they're actually very specifically used, you know, wanting to do that. Yeah. It, it's interesting. You sort of say, and again, that was a that was a, 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 a as for that dictatorial regime coming out of a sort of left-wing socialist government, that was a sort of a thing that was in the ether in the in the 70s, in the six, late 60s and 70s, wasn't it? You, mm. you know, um, there's that there's that series that's got the guy, Edward Woodward, in it. Yeah, 1990. which is basically yeah. all about this guy who's a, who's a part, who's a sort of insider of this socialist dictatorship in Great Britain. Yeah. Who then is sort of trying to undermine it from within? There's other, there's there's smatterings of stuff all through seventies popular culture re- that mm. reference this kind of stuff. So mm. yeah, but yeah, no, we, Jerry really yeah. wants to use the, and this is the whole conflict he's got with with uh, Vincent. Is that Vincent's just a biker and wants to go on runs and hang out and commit crimes, whereas Jerry's got a political agenda mm. and is smarter. Is is smarter? I'm not sure. If we if we look at the end of the book, then we I don't suppose we want to can you can you plot spoil an NEL biker book? I'm not no, sure. No. No, you can't. So it's as you say, there's this massive basically battle in the quarry. Most of the last heroes are killed. Um, some are captured and executed, which again is that fascist government sort of thing. The remainder of the gang under Jerry's leadership go north to Wales, which mm. I'm not sure. Not being, not having been in Britain, hoping to come at some point in the next year or two, but not have, never having been there. I presume that going north to Wales in the early 1970s was like disappearing into a misty cloud and never being well, seen again. F- funnily enough, when I read this, we went to the northwest coast of Wales to a place called Barmouth. And the reason we went to Barmouth, actually not the whole reason, but one of the reasons we went to Barmouth is because it's the setting for Guy N. Smith's Night of the Crabs. And I was really curious. Uh, sadly, there isn't a statue of King Crab there on, on the harbour. Like no, there there's no plaque. There's no statue of King Crab on the harbour. It's absolutely scandalous. That but, is such a missed tourism Absolutely. It really option. is. Yeah, sorry. Go. So... We're in Barmouth, and one of the places we drove through to get to Barmouth, when it's describing their drive west from the Midlands into through Wales, through Snowdonia, it describes the bikes driving through a Welsh town. I thought, hang on a minute, we drove the, through there to come here. It's only about 30 minutes away. And it turns out that I'm sitting there reading this, looking out over Cardigan Bay, and Jerry and his gang where he has his fast last confrontation with Vincent and takes Vincent out is about was about 20 miles up the road from us <laughs> which is just the the weirdest piece of synchronicity yeah yeah it's absolutely incredible so so we knew the entire area we'd been traveling around the entire area where Jerry and his gang decide to uh, to go and hole up and i can imagine in the 90 i mean they're not busy areas now but I can imagine in the 1970s, uh, yeah, if you wanted to disappear somewhere, the 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 Welsh coast or Cardigan Bay or somewhere like that was a pretty good place to go. Mm. And so he disappears there. The the public revulsion over the heavy-handed police tactics in the in the quarry battle basically bring down this uh, authoritarian government, and mm. so that's you know so. And then, and Jerry lives to fight. An, Jerry lives to fight another day in Angel's Challenge in 1973, where mm. Jerry has formed. So the last, uh, what are they called? The last heroes have under Jerry have formed an alliance, as I say, with that rather spectral Welsh bike again, the Wolves. Mm. And this is a, a, another thing that is a sort of trope in uh, a lot of this kind of fiction and film. The dictatorial government has been replaced by a very permissive government, and of course, it's allowed all the youth gangs to flourish, and they've started to take over. Mm. So they go to they go on this run to London, and there's this sort of climactic battle. There's this, it's a conflict about these two biker gangs or two gangs that are really big in London at the time. One is called the Ghouls, mm. 
and the ghouls are the, the gay biker gang who dress in satin and platform heels, and there's this street gang based on skinheads. Mm. Because of course you've got to get, you've got to try and shoehorn skinheads in, into them somewhere. Yeah, and then of course later on there's another there's a third book, Guardian Angels in 1974. So angel so so Angels from Hell and Angels Challenge are both 1973. So Lawrence is writing about two a year, and in 74 he does Guardian Angels, which is um, Jerry's biker gang emerging from Wales to provide security for a major rock concert but of course the 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 rock groups have employed skin have employed hell's angels from america to do Mm. it unbeknownst to unbeknownst to jerry's gang so of course there's a huge conflict over there and then there's a sort of the the, the only other one i've read 1974 angels on my mind which Mm. again is incredibly dystopian definitely going to read more and yeah I think one again, one of the more intriguing aspects at the end of the book, which I may have dismissed a few years ago, is the idea that the gang go from being vilified by the public for for violence, violence to women, violence to blind uh, Buddhists, Buddhist, and tunnels, Buddhist pedestrians, yeah, and and bank managers and bank managers' daughters to be in some kind of folk heroes for opposing the big state. And it's funny reflecting on that now, given what we know about, I don't know, for example, social media figures that we won't name, who actually have form for sexual violence, being hero worshipped by the youth for standing up to the big state. Either way, it's it's pretty grim, but there's truth to it. And no matter which side of the argument you fall on, it just still makes this absolutely fascinating. And we're going to get on to... It's a fascinating cultural artefact, and all sorts of things within it ring true all these, today. All these NEL books are. I, yeah. All these NEL, all these New English Library. I think what we can we can summarize them as youth exploitation books. Yeah, are all fascinating cultural artifacts, which is again what makes NEL such an interesting publisher, both 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 in terms of publishing deliberately targeting books to, to segments of the population that no one wrote for, or except pulp, and and doing it so effectively. Mm. I suppose it's uh, a sad indictment of modern society that people are striking those chords on fucking TikTok rather than <laughs> through really good books. But yeah, yes, yes. so that was Angels from Hell, a really eye-opening, fun read on the whole. But we also read The Devil's Rider. Oh yes, yes, yes. by Alex Stewart. So, what do you know about Alex R. Stewart? I know that he was a pseudonym for Richard A. Gordon, who wrote science fiction. He wrote his body. He wrote uh, one, two, three, four, at least four. Oh, no, rough, I think he wrote five biker books between 1971 and 1973. He was Scottish. He also did a series of travel guides. And his uh, Alex R. Stewart pseudonym was the, excuse me, was the pseudonym he used for his biker books, and he died in 2009. Mm. So along with Peter Cave, Mick Norman, a.k.a. Uh, Lawrence James, and Alex R. Stewart, a.k.a. Richard A. Gordon, mm. they were the three biker novelists for NEL. Mm. There were other people, I think, on the margins, and I know that NEL, because bikers were such hot cultural property, publishing property in the early 1970s from, for pulp, that NEL also published a, a large number of US biker pulps and, you know, whatever they could get their hands on, they published, as well as commissioning these three guys to write books. Hmm. So Alex R. Stewart wrote, I think, five or six, didn't he? He had a series of which The Devil's Rider is the third or four, maybe the fourth in five. that series. He wrote, he wrote five, yes, and then he wrote, I've got, uh, he's got The Bikers in 1971, The Outlaws in 1972, and we really have to, just some of the some of these these cover photographs. So they're very simple, yeah. You know, but they actually have probably probably have the sec, probably have one of the secretaries and one of their mates come yeah. come in and do it. But they look there's you know the covers of the outlaws is this woman with long hair and there's this guy with a beard and sort of dark John Lennon sunglasses behind him, look carrying what looks like this huge pot lead pipe. You know, the last trip 1972, and then his yes his book The Devil's Rider in 1973. And there was a sequel which I haven't read to The Devil's Rider called The Bike from Hell. Yeah, I picked that up from, as it happens, from eBay in a a, a 
bulk buy of NEL oh, biker yeah. novels. Yeah, which is The Devil's Rider was in there as well. But yeah, The Devil's yeah. Rider cover is fantastic because it, it does look like they just dragged some guy out of the storeroom and festooned him in leather and studs and sat him on a bike and took a picture. It's brilliant. I love which it. Is pretty much what they always did. That's right. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. Now, these two books... Norman Stroke. The Devil's Rider yeah. and the other one. Yeah. Oh, no, sorry, the first one. Sorry, yeah. sorry. So Lawrence James, Stroke, McNorman, and Alex Astew are writing these books around about the same time. They're both writing them for NEL, but they are chalk and cheese. They are so different to each other. And it actually took me by surprise just how different this one was because we talked about Angels from Hell being a mashup of two genres. Well, so is The Devil's Rider, but in a slightly different way. Because he's really tapping into something which, initially when I was reading the book, let's talk about the setup. So we've got a similar kind of setup, but on this occasion we've got our protagonist, Johnny, who's hooked up with a bike gang, the Sons of Baal. Although it actually starts in media res with a, a run through London before flashing back a little bit to find out how he ended up in trouble on this run, believing that his bike has been hexed by Sam, the leader of the Sons of Baal. So they're led by Sam a curiously charismatic bloke that holds his gang kind of spellbound with tales of his either previous incarnations as some kind of priest or mystic or priestesses in in Babylonian times, in thrall to ancient powers and spirits, and, and they all really dig it, and they all love it. Johnny less so, but he fancies Sam's missus, who's known as Ish. So you've got this, you've got this setup, which is... At first, I'm thinking, right, this guy is just some kind of strange mashup of a hippie spiritualist reincarnation guru and biker leader. And the book is more authentic in terms of detail, in terms of the bikes. You've got the some of the bikers showing disdain for certain aspects and technicalities of what they see as lesser bikes. Like uh, there's this guy, Ron Hughes, who drives a Honda 504, and Lenny thinks that it's a, it's a shit bike because he's got a problem with, with Japanese bikes. Although when I was a teen... In the 80s, my girlfriend's boyfriend had a Honda CB500. He was a biker. And him and all his mates thought CB500s were brilliant. So I don't know what Lenny's problem is, but Lenny likes his BSAs and his Nortons. He's very hardcore British biker. So you've got these lovely kind of details and technicalities about the bikes that just make it feel ever so slightly more authentic in terms of detail. And it's also pretty great in terms of evocative writing too, and I'll I'll, I'll read a little bit from the run through central London in a bit. But then... It becomes a full-on <laughs> supernatural, not devil novel, but it's it's tapping into that sort of exorcist zeitgeist of supernatural thrillers and Rosemary's Babies and every, everything else that was going on at the time and becomes a full-on supernatural thriller. It's amazing and really well-written, although I do have some issues with it. Yeah. It is It is well-written and it is quite an interesting book. I have to say that I think... For my money, the last third made absolutely no sense at all. Oh, it goes, it falls off a cliff, the last yeah, third. Yeah, and then it's obviously this guy we're talking about, um, Richard A. Gordon. So Richard is throwing every single piece of weird, occult, supernatural. He's, he's pillaging about three or four, you know, um, supernatural phenomenon and global phenomenon. He's really just, he just chucks everything but the kitchen sink. Yeah. Into it, it's never really, it's never really clear what I thought. What was the most interesting thing to me about it? Um, Johnny Sutton hanging out with this strange occult biker group, the Sons mm. of Baal, and it's it's actually I've got a I've got a passage here. It does, and again, this is it really taps into that. He's a good writer. It it it, it taps the first half at least makes is quite coherent. He's on the run. He's. It turns out that he's basically joined this group. Let me get the backstory. He's joined the group, basically challenged Sam's reign, and has got eyes for Ish, I, 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 aka Ishtar, you know, um, mm. Sam's girlfriend and the sort of co-leader of the bikey group. And for that, and for his general rebelliousness, Sam hexes his bike. They go on this run, which you're about to read from, and Sam's bike crashes, and he ends up in hospital and then in prison where he gets this series of uh, weird occult um, nightmares. But, of course, the whole thing I thought was really interesting, This is, I'm just going to read about um, Johnny's backstory. Yeah. So Johnny started hanging out with the Sons of Baal. 
hanging out round Sam, though he didn't think of it like that. Johnny didn't have a job. He'd had a job a year before in a light engineering factory, but it hadn't lasted long. The union called them out to back up a 20% rise demand. The government tried its hand at industrial relations, so Johnny found himself hustling out of pubs into picket lines, getting blue-bottled rough and tight. With a balding, long-haired guy with a fanatical national health spectacle shouting at him to stand firm in the struggle against capitalist oppression, brother, he'd almost belted the guy. Johnny didn't give a fuck about capitalist depression, (laughs) repression or compression. It was there. He could see it in his redundant father tearing itself and its phony loyalties apart. So what? He reckoned that all politicians were full of power trip shit, no matter what words they spoke. He'd gone home, but his father had seen him in the picket line on the 10 o'clock news. The result was a battle and a smashed TV set. His father breathing heavy and bloody in the rented wreckage. Johnny left home. The settlement resulted in a nationalisation, which meant that Johnny and a lot of others got fired with a week's pay for compensation. He became a statistic. Somebody else's worry. He just signed each week and laughed when the clerks glared at him. He didn't look ashamed enough at being out of work. He wasn't interested. He couldn't live like blue suede shoes on the doll. He hung out with mates and spent it all on a bike. It was nothing great. A 500cc Norton he caught secondhand of some guy who was changing to four wheels, sick of being hassled by riding two. To Johnny, any bike was better than no bike. He'd written the previous one off on the North Circular some weeks before, been lucky to stay alive or unlucky. He hadn't worked that one out. Sometimes when he was really stoned, he wanted to get across to the other side to see what went down. Maybe there'd been something of that weird wish in him when he went off the road that night. It's a great setup for a character. That, and it's also the 70s in the UK. Yeah. And, you know, to some degree, because, of course, it was much later in the US, in America, in Australia, in Australia, you know. Mm. And I think this is where, on reflection, one of the problems with a book starts to emerge. Because John is set up as a really interesting POV character. But he's not the POV character in the book. In fact, the book can't settle on one key POV character. And about halfway through the book, it introduces a load more, and we'll get to that. And this book ends up feeling more like an account than a story. And that's one of its weaknesses. But if they'd have stuck, sorry, if, if the author had have stuck with some of the early stuff and continued along this line, rather than vanishing up his own occult ass and just going through pages reams and reams of exposition later on in the book it would have been great because the run through trafalgar square is fantastic so it says they see right away that trafalgar square is making it tonight it looks like lord nelson would get higher up the column if he could but he's frozen solid like lot's wife looking down on the gomorrah scenes beneath his noble feet and it's lucky those lines are made of stone people are perched astride their shaggy manes and waving banners the sons of Baal move behind Sam to the inside of the road round the central part of the square. It's yellow with light. The fountains sparkle. Dave the Key reads the banners held by two people on the nearest of the Imperial Lions. One reads, Jesus was a little child. The other says, Fuck the Pope. There's an unholy battle in progress between the bearers of the respective banners. First one dips into obscurity, battering heads in the million crowd. Then the other and the roar of the nine bikes adds to the sound and confusion which is making life hell for the pigeons trying to sleep behind the eaves of the National Gallery, behind the underlit yellow school facades of the adjacent buildings which are due to be pulled down and redeveloped. The vibrations of the bikes make the night more indigestible for them, and many heads in the crowds turn to locate the bikes they're here, but many more people are involved in strong local scenes in the chaotic Christmas arena, involving all kinds of heated disputations and banner bashing. Several militant groups decided to come down tonight and harangue the tourists. That's just fine, except most of the groups involved hate each other like the plague. Every one of them believes there's just one way to save the world and that all the others are agents of the Antichrist. So in several places, there are people going for each other like the survival of civilization as we know it depends upon the results of their confrontations. There are large and enthusiastic audiences for each battle. People out of the pubs and out of the shows cheering on Trotskyites beating international socialists, bashing moral crusaders, who are ganging up on anyone who looks morally confused with clumps of police conferring by radio and holding the crowds back, letting the madmen kick the shit out of each other before moving in to mop up and lay charges, 
where appropriate. Elderly American tourists in search of Dickens are looking confused. This is not the fantasy the tourist agencies laid on them. In the northwest corner, a wild-eyed astrologer is explaining to bewildered people that all these bad scenes are due to Mars and Saturn conjoined in opposition to the sun. Tattered political leaflets demand immediate liberation for the human race lie soggy and trampled beneath thousands of feet. Their urgent messages running in the water, wind-whipped onto the plaza from the fountains. The police are not removing people paddling in the pool around the fountains. A stoned girl calls out, Merry Christmas, Merry Christmas, over and over again. She's paddling, soaked and shoeless. A red frisbee spins over her head and dislodges a grey fedora from the head of a middle-aged man with two young daughters, but he makes no attempt to retrieve it. He's hardly even conscious that it's gone. He's standing, open-mouthed, red-faced with indignation, because some guy just slipped out of the crowd, whispered in his ear, offered to sell him dope and change his grey-grey life. The guy was gone before he could counterblast and call a cop. But what makes it bad are the barely suppressed expressions on the faces of his daughters aged nine and twelve, respectively. The sons of Baal are just like another circus act in this open-air asylum, but they're trapped in the traffic, revving up, mounting the pavements, cursing the people, unable to carve a way through. Local population density is acute, and emotions are high. Everyone's put something inside them tonight, in the pubs and the clubs and the paranoid pads, all celebrating the birth of Mithras, locked in the crush of the square, in machines or on their feet, exhaust swirling and horns blasting uptight tones, people picking their way through the stationary crossword vehicles, voices shouting, at the sons of Baal, liquorheads burning with social indignation from Daimler and from Jag, patrolling cops, checking out the situation, approaching. That's pretty great for, you know, for, for a pulp novel. It's, it's so evocative. It's wonderful. It's, you can almost smell Trafalgar Square from that. And if it just stuck with that kind of approach, whereas what we get later on is similar tracts of narrative, just talking endlessly about, Bab- about Babylon... <laughs> <laughs> and, 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 various, and, and, and energy and yeah and it's this we i can never quite figure out so so sam works for this group called the nine yeah we're never explained funnily enough i was thinking who the fuck are the nine yeah and later on <laughs> there is a throwaway literary reference that leads you down a rabbit hole to read a whole different series of books by a whole different author if you want to find out who the nine are is that author actually uh, one of the pseudonyms of Richard A. Gordon, I wonder? No, it's oh, not. Okay. It's not, weirdly enough. And uh, we'll get to that. I'll, I'll, I'll bring that back up. So we've got this setup where Johnny wants to take on the big cheese of the gang. Sam displace him, fulfill his infatuation with Ish, Ishtar, Sam's babe. Sam's selling his status as a reincarnation of a Babylonian god or mystic or whatever. Johnny thinks Sam put a hex on his bike. We'll find out later. He really did. <laughs> and the bike is... So we've got a cursed bike. We've got we've got a guy who embodies the power of the Nine or is a reincarnation of something or is whatever. And Johnny injures a girl at a crossing on this London run and ends up getting roughed up by the old Bill who want him to dish the skinny on Sam. So far, so good. And Johnny has a really poor time. And for the rest of the book, Johnny's just having a really shit time in jail. So Johnny is no long, is not the protagonist of the book, which is what I kind of mm. expected. But there's this weird bit after what I just read where Sam, the first time you get an inkling that Sam has some kind of gnarly power, because a load of coppers who are ready for a ruck pile out of a van to lay into some of the bikers, and Sam stands between the bikers and them and just suddenly disarms them all. I don't mean literally disarms them all, but has a conversation with them and they all just suddenly forget that they're there to engage in aggro with bikers and and the bikers just move on and get away. And you think, hang on a minute, there's something to this Sam character. A little bit later, he wants a parking ticket, so he just taps the parking machine and it spits a ticket out, much to the disgust of the businessman standing next to him, who then tries to get a free ticket out of the parking machine. Suddenly, the book starts to lay itself out and, and chapter five, it really lays its cards out. And we find out the bike is hexed, the bike is cursed, because we get a, an account of the subsequent owners and the terrible things that befall them. So this is now a full-on supernatural thriller biker novel. And whilst the seeds for that are laid early in the book, for it to so, suddenly go rampantly so early in the novel in confirming all of this, and this is now the case, 
it it shows its hand a little bit too early, I think, and I don't think it ever really recovers from that beyond that point. Well, as you say, I mean, Sam, they're setting Sam up to be the main character, and actually he just spends most of the rest of the book, he spends the entire rest of the book, as you say, in prison, Yeah, having these strange occult, losing weight and having these strange occult nightmares and having visitations with his mom. Hmm. So there's, there's other plot strands that sort of happen. There's these two sort of kind of like occult investigators, Patrick and Mona Goffman, yep. but nothing ever really seems to happen with them. Yep. So Johnny's in jail. Sam is expanding his occult empire and there's this kind of inference that he goes on television and there's this inference that he's sort of hypnotising England to be sort of like, you know, to to, to follow him. These two occult investigators, Patrick and Mona Goffman, who are kind of onto him, mm. but really don't do anything. The haunted bike, the police that attempt to ensnare Sam by sending another undercover invest undercover cop into his group, and then mm. there's another one where they there's this woman, there's this hostess who is on drugs charges, and they basically say to her, "Look, we'll we'll drop the drugs charges if you." try and sort of implicate, you know, get, get, get kind of, in, what's the word, become an undercover operative in the mm-hmm. Sons of Baal. But, of course, Sam just has to look at these people and they suddenly fall under his sway. And then there's this cop called Carling who, as rumours spread that Sam is brewing something big, even slightly apocalyptic, he's trying to get, mm. he's trying to find out what's happening. And it all ends up with Sam and his gang and various other people, it's really not, sphere it's not clearly described it really does fall off a cliff converging on stonehenge Mm. for this scene that actually for me prefigured the 1979 itv series quatermass yes (laughs) yes you know the the planet people yeah the planet where where, and sam and lilith are sucked up yeah as energy and in front of this crowd that have converged on stonehenge and rumours spread that Sam and Lilith have been, they've been sucked up and made energy. They're going to return and lead the Sons of Baal against the government. Yeah, I don't know whether I don't know whether the sequel, The Bike from Hell, explains that. The Bike from Hell is all about the hexed bike. Okay, so we we don't we never really find out what happens to Sam. So, so no, Sam. We, we don't find out. And this this is the frustrating thing about it that the second act or is is split into three books, isn't it? And the second act, book two, gets really really massively bogged down in exposition because uh, mm. sam's getting in power and he wants to make his run to stern and it pulls in hoffman uh, patrick hoffman and mona he talks to them through their stereo so they're introduced halfway through the book so huh, right of course he does of yes. course he does so they're, they're now going to be have some kind of impact on this he talks to them and he basically wants them also to come to stonehenge meanwhile ish is semi-conscious because she's trying to oppose him or something and yeah, she's, she's such a thinly drawn character, though. Isn't yeah, she's she's it's beaming out like, his true name, Nerlith, yeah. into the ether, and it's well, causing her to wane in power. And it it really, really isn't clear. Johnny's getting interrogated all the time by DCS Ivor Carling, but it's it's still not clear to them exactly what threat Sam poses. Even earlier on, it's it's really unclear why the Met are after Sam, even before that TV appearance. They're after Sam because. Sam, Sam, basically. It's, there's, there's a little bit of lazy shorthand in there. And that lack of a POV character really, really does harm it. But on the road to Stonehenge, there's, there's this reference, which is your only key to who the Nine are or what it's all about. And um, I forgot to put what page it is, but it says, The sound of engines comes to Stonehenge. It's old. Its stones are cold and black against the fading night. The stones were old when Sam was first born human. They alone know what they are and what's gone down. In recent times as well. The nine are not unknown here, in various shapes and forms. And then there's a very short sentence that says, The memoirs of Lord Grandrith make that clear. Volume 10. That's all it says. If you're reading this in 1973 and you haven't got the internet, you're fucked. You haven't got a clue. But, Who is he? Is that an actual person? So Lord Glandrith, Philip Jose Farmer in the 60s wrote a series of novels based upon his take on Tarzan, i.e. Lord Greystoke, and Doc Savage, who he called Caliban. And Lord Glandrith is Philip Jose's far- um, analogue of Lord Greystoke, 
And in those books, he and Doc Savage initially fight each other, but then come together to fight the Nine. So if you want to know who the Nine are, you've got to go and read some Philip Jose Farmer novels. <laughs> right, okay. Oh. Like, what the fuck? What the fuck, Alex yeah, Stewart? It, 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 doesn't, it just doesn't work. I mean, it, it lacks Lawrence... Ch- I mean, some of the writing, is that, that passage you wrote, you yeah. read, I think is a really good passage, but it lacks... Lawrence James's countercultural infusion. I mean, it, it's mm. full of gobbledygook about the supernatural, but it makes no sense and it goes nowhere. Yeah, yeah. Lacks I'd... Lawrence James's countercultural, anti-establishment sort of vibe, which yeah. is what makes Angels. It, what is what makes the first book we talked about so good. It's odd you know? that the way he introduces these new characters when he introduces Karen, the informer, after. They might have tried with that copper, and he tries to infiltrate and get him with get him with Sam and Sam threw, threw him straight away and dismisses him. They pull in Karen, aka Selena, the hostess who's been done for drugs, and she goes in. And you actually do get this really nice scene at this concert where she goes in and tries to insinuate herself into the gang. She um, she's getting tailed by police officers. There's an amusing part where she, she her way into the gang is to accused one of the police officers of touching her up, so Lenny, the biggest and toughest biker, duffs up this copper, and then she gets into the gang. But, of course, it's a biker novel, so it doesn't really go according to plan. She has quite an unpleasant experience. But she has gumption and she has urgency in her predicament, much more so than I expected. So for that brief moment, she's the POV character, and then she's referenced maybe three times in the rest of the book. And it just moves on. It's like, right, I've established this character. Lenny, though, I'd like Yeah. Yeah, no, and, no, and, no, and we know that she has a slight conflict with Lenny's old, old lady, but it's in no way expanded upon. Then it introduces Ivor Carling, then it introduces Patrick and Mona, and it all builds up to this climax at Stonehenge. Patrick and Mona are there, they have zero impact on any of it. It's immaterial they're that they're even them. there. They're just watching, aren't they? Yeah, they're just watching. It's absolutely yeah, immaterial they're that they're there. Sam's made all this effort to get them there, they're there. Makes no difference. DCS Ivor Carling doesn't even get there. He's 40 miles away in a helicopter. He has no impact whatsoever on it. And the final chapter, we don't even really know what happened because the final chapter is Johnny, I think, astrally projecting over Stonehenge and being the witness to Sam and Ish transcending from their human form or ascending from their human form. And there's, Sam's setting up, early on, Sam is setting up the idea that the bike, the cursed bike, must be maintained for Johnny. Must be maintained for Johnny. Nobody must touch it. Nobody must ride it. But you must keep it maintained because it's Johnny will ride that bike again. That never happens. The hex bike's never mentioned again. And Johnny astrally projects over the scene at the end, watching something go down that isn't particularly clear. And then the government bring back witchcraft law at the end. That's right. Yes, they ban they ban a whole lot of things at the end, don't they? They sort of talk yeah. about ban rafting. Yeah, I don't know what else to say. It's a wild ride until halfway through, and then you hit a massive patch of mud and never get out of it again. Yeah, but worth a read. Again, interesting, interesting mashup of genres. As I say, I've got the bike from hell here, and the the, the reverse reads: the sons and daughters of Baal rode high to Stonehenge on that midsummer night. Johnny's black bike was sold after his trial four times. It killed two owners and injured a third. So it was brought back to wait for Johnny's release. Well, we know all that because we've just read The Devil's Riders. And it says, it's all coming together, but there are still several loose threads in the web, threads which are almost invisible and might not be seen in time, threads upon which everything depends. So if you've got any problems with The Devil's Rider, (laughs) if you want any of those loose ends picking up, you've got to read The Bike from Hell, if you can be bothered. (laughs) Yeah, look, but I mean, who knows? Through the sort of mi- miasma of dope smoke and occult black Aquarius kind of <laughs> vibes and general cultural upheaval that was going on in the UK and other parts of the world in the early 1970s, maybe it all made complete sense. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe. I doubt it, though. I doubt it, though. To be fair, had I read this when I was stoned in the 90s, perhaps. I still, I still don't think it would have made any sense. I might have enjoyed that last. I was going to say the last third, but probably the last half a little bit more. But I don't know. I'm not convinced. It's like in the way that I used to be able to sit through every single 
dubbed Godzilla film from the 1970s back to back with zero problems whatsoever without the benefit of derp smoke not quite as enjoyable an experience maybe this still even though I can enjoy them just not back to back maybe this fits into the same bracket I don't know nevertheless worth a read have you seen the 1973, I mean, Don Sharp film Psychomania? Yeah, which... and all, all my memories of Psychomania are these terrible bikers are the most well-behaved bikers. <laughs> I think there I could, is an I could possibly scene. imagine. It's about a supernatural bikey, biker gang. Yeah. And there is a great scene where the bikers literally ride out of the grave. That's that right. is it's worth the price of admission. But I wonder, I didn't look at the date. I mean, we don't know when in 1973... The Devil's a the Devil's Rider was published, but I was thinking, oh yeah. So Richard A. Gordon has actually has actually, oh, actually and also Lawrence James have and other English New English Library editors have watched Don Sharp's nineteen seventy three film Psychomania. Mm. Quick, we need an occult biker book. Maybe, or maybe it was the other way around. I don't know because I, I, I think Psychomania was an Amicus Films production. I, I, I'm not going to look it up. It was it was one of those British production companies. It might have been Amicus. It might have been one of the other independent British production companies. You know, th- that could afford to get Beryl Reed in. Beryl Reed was probably the most expensive member of the cast on that movie. And I know Beryl Reed did some Amicus films like um, The Beast in the Cellar, which is fucking great. But yeah, so I remember the main scene I remember from that is the biker waving from his balcony and then th- and then jumping off. And when they're all the dead bikers, their bikes are pristine. They all look pristine even before the they actually become undead bikers. The, I think the worst thing they do is say things like "Don't hassle me, man." You know that they're not particularly badly behaved people. But, of course, by the standards of people going to the cinema at the time, it was extraordinarily tame, even for a 1970s film, I think. But, yeah, the concept of undead bikers, yeah, maybe so. I don't know. But Well, it was released in March 1973 or so, IMDb tells me. So that's relatively easier in the year. Relatively, sorry, early in the year. Yeah. That allows um, Richard A. Gordon at least a few months to bang out mm. a supernatural biker book. Yeah, so, so uh, the, oh. This is the first edition NEL paperback I've just discovered from Open and Up. Yes. Which explains why it's so tatty. Uh, Has yours also got, this is what I really I mean, can I just say about Psychomania too? Hello, George Sanders. Ah. Which who is the best thing about the film in my view. I, I mean, for, as I forgot he was in it. I'm all about Yeah, Beryl he Reed. is the best thing. Not a great film. But I do also like, I don't know if your copy, my, is my, what is my copy of The Devil's Rider is, uh, Oh, mine's 1975, so yeah. mine's not a first edition. So but this mine is... does have a terrific um, ad in the middle of it for Prudential Insurance. <laughs> what, one of, the old card, 30... one of the old cards that are just stuck in the yeah, middle? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Around £13,000 can make your retirement as carefree as this. Oh, if only that so was that's... still the case. Yes, I know. <laughs> absolutely. Yeah. But um, there you go. That's that. That's who, obviously, that's, that's... Well, the devil... It... I can't, I can't like yeah, ir- irritatingly, and I'm only spotting this now because I'm looking at the publication date. So this was copyright Alex Stewart, 1972. First paperback edition, January 1973. So it predates Psychomania by a few months, but Psychomania will have been in production. So you never know. People know each other, don't they? People move in similar circles when it comes to the writers. Trades, the trades would have said that Don Sharp is doing a supernatural biker book, yeah. you know, biker the, the, film. They're all probably the same pubs in Soho. You know, absolutely, yeah, Abs- uh, the same orgy, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but, <laughs> the same. But the, the same crazy, the crazy thing about this page, and I never spotted it before. And if I had a spotted it before, I'd have looked it up before. Is it says to Lord Glandrith and the Apes of Wrath? Uh, so he's already it's showing it's... his hand before you even start the book. Yeah, but that's a fair. It'd be pretty impressive to spot that. Well, the only the only person in 1972 who's going to have a fucking Scooby Doo, what that means, is someone who's read one of those Philip Jose Farmer books, which were published maybe five years before this. So, but the, the, you know, there's a few things in here, isn't there? There's at one point where uh, Sam is telling the bikers all of his stories, and and Johnny challenges him. He says, "I don't know what's that. Is it like one of those Cthulhu gods or something?" And it's, you know, in 1972. The only people who are going to know what the bloody hell that means are people who have been picking up probably 60s or 70s Grafton or Panther editions of August Daleth edited 
HP Lovecraft stories. This is probably targeted at. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Because Cthulhu, the word Cthulhu is ubiquitous now. Everybody knows it. Even from when it was on the the real Ghostbusters cartoon, you've got Cthulhu, Funko Pops and all fucking sorts. I would say one in 10,000 people had a clue what Cthulhu was, or probably less, when this was written. So, yeah. But there you go. Two NEL biker novels. What an experience. Absolutely. Absolutely. Mm. And there's so much more in the world of NEL. Well... I'm sure at some point down the line we could maybe have a conversation and pick another brace. Oh, from... look, yeah, I think we can do that. I yeah. think we can do that. And I'm just looking at my bookshelf up here. It's actually a bit, a bit high up the NELs, but there is a wealth of NEL goodness yeah. up there. I think the skinhead books have probably been done to death, but there's a lot of other stuff going down mm. in NEL in the 1970s and early 80s. Well, you know what? It's been absolutely brilliant to have you back again talking about these things and we will maybe make a couple of choice selections for a few months down the line. And now we've talked about Gale Gangs, Biker Boys and Real Cool Cats, maybe we should be picking something from your third publication. We've covered two of them, so let's have a look what's around in that one. Let me find yeah, the, sec- the second one. Um, well, we've done Gale Gangs, Biker Boys and Real Cool Cats. We've done Dangerous Worlds and New Visions. Sorry, New Visions. Di- Dangerous Worlds, Jesus. I'm on my third stupid porter, and it's not twelve o'clock yet. I think I think it was probably a bit early in the day. Uh, although I must say, fierce may contain brambles. Bramble porter is actually pretty good. Not bad for an eleven. Well, it's Sunday. You can go and have a lie down, can't you? <laughs> of course I can. Yeah. Well, I've got to make probably have to make Phil's lunch first, but I'm sure then I can have a siesta. Yeah, yeah absolutely. But your third book, I can got it around here some, somewhere. Sticking it to the man. Sticking it to the man. So. Um... As yes. as each as our two podcasts so far have been themed around the contents of one of those books, maybe we should try and pick a couple of NEL books that feature in somewhere with sticking it to the man. I don't have it in front of me, but there is we do anyway, there are things, yes. There yeah. are there are definitely things we could do. All right, cool. Yeah. Well, thanks again for dropping back into Derry and Tom's and we'll sort some out further down the line. Yeah, an absolute pleasure. Really enjoyed it. Cheers. <laughs> Massive thanks to Andrew for coming back to Derry and Tom's for a second go around. Andrew's website is pulpcurry.com and his books, produced with his co editor Ian McIntyre and available from all good stockists, are Sticking It to the Man Revolution and Counterculture in Pulp and Popular Fiction, 1950 to 1980, Gal Gangs, Biker Boys, and Real Cool Cats. Pulp Fiction and Youth Culture, 1950 to 1980. And Dangerous Visions and New Worlds, Radical Science Fiction, 1950 to 1985. And of course, that was the subject of our last podcast together, so check that one out. Since recording this show, I learned that Alex R. Stewart was particularly interested in the paranormal and the occult, and in the early 90s produced an encyclopedia under one of his other pen names, Stuart Gordon. So naturally, I picked it up, and it's pretty good. And subsequently, after the penny dropped, I realised that a trilogy I got from Pops back in the 80s and rather enjoyed was also by Stuart Gordon. So I had in fact read him previously, albeit over 30 years ago. The Eyes trilogy, One Eye, Two Eyes and Three Eyes, is a gonzo, if a bit dry at times, post-apocalyptic mutant swords and weird signs tale that's long out of print, but definitely worth checking out if you're that way inclined. But thanks as always to our patrons. First, those without tear, Anthony Piconti, Tim Cardos, Dave Dempster, and Sebastian Weetabix. And our chaos engineers, Andrew Cicluna, Andrew Van Ness, Anthony Porter, Benjamin Fletcher, Craig Ledley, Dave Griffiths, Dave Voxman, Gabriel Laycock, Harvey Faulkner Aston, Jim Kirkland, Jim Knight, John W. Lays, Jules Lawrence, Lee Gary, Mal Pertwee, Mary Catherine, Matt Saltz, Menion, Nelbert, Paul McRandall, Scott Butler, Simon Perrins, and Tony Malazzo. And to our crafty Jugaderos, Alexander Harris, Ian Stead, Loz, Taylor, Matthew Broom, Toby White, Tom Murphy, Mark Hebden, Graham Holden, Jason Connolly, and Ray Otis. And eternal thanks to our patron demons. First on the list this time, and new to the Don Blass executive staterooms, Greg Faulkner. And as is traditional, I drop Greg a line to see what's what. 
and Greg said, Hi Andy, I'm told there was no equivalent to the satanic panic in the UK, but in the US in the early 80s it was dead serious. All my Moldvay rule books, modules and miniatures were confiscated and tossed out. Incredibly, my parents never understood that D&D was just one of dozens of role-playing games, and I cheerfully picked up Stormbringer. I was hooked. Elric led to Corum, led to Hawkmoon, led to airships and polar bear sleigh teams. It led to Mike Mignola, and Lieber, and Herbert, and Eldritch Horrors Uncounted, and now to Breakfast in the Ruins. Thank you for doing this. No, nope, thank you, Greg. It continues to humble me that people enjoy this enough to pay towards the upkeep, but also for the kind words. And that satanic panic point is indeed true for the most part. It never really took off here. Although a friend of the show, Andy Clark, was once interviewed about it back in the day. I should throw a screenshot of that on the blog at some point. Maybe the Wirral's more prone than Hull, I don't know. But maybe that's why someone over there stole my hat last year so they could put a hex on me. The shits. Anyway, I'll try to get that out of my system and carry on with the thanks. So thanks to Andy Darby, Clarky the Cruel, Fred Keish, Gareth Wilson, Gwen Barlow, Imria, Jenny Stim, Jay Risa, Joe Monty, Liam J, Miles Riedelbato, Mark Mayne, Neil Burton, Paul Hillary, Randall Gatlin, Steve Round, David Lee, the OG patron Norman Beresford, and last but never least, Robert McMillan. Enough yakking, don't forget you can follow us on Twitter and Instagram with the handle at Breakfast Ruins. You can email us at breakfastruins at outlook.com. The webpage is breakfastintheruins.com. BITR Breakfast in the Ruins Radio is live again on Radio Garden or via a web player at breakfastintheruinsradio.blogspot.com. We have our Patreon page too, there are a few extra odds and sods on there. But for now, take care, stay safe, we will meet again soon on the Moonbeam Rods. <laughs>